welcome. Thanks to all of you for braving the fog on Atherton Mountain and coming through Fancy Gap and dodging construction on 220 to join us for this very important celebration of life today. Nearly 50 years ago, on Valentine's Day, 1964, the faculty band Handbones performed the music you just heard right here in the Little Theater. So we thought there was no more appropriate place than this in which to celebrate the life and legacy of indeed the legend, Louis Rubin, our master harmonica player. And indeed, as Lewis's nephew, Daniel, recently told us, Lewis always considered Hollands to be home. Former president at Hollands, Jack Everett, hired Lewis in 1957. This proven scholar and inspired teacher went on to establish Hollands' nationally acclaimed creative writing program and went on to become such a powerful scholar that he is often described as the father of Southern literary studies. At Hollands, we especially appreciate the impact of his contributions, which continue to distinguish our program in creative writing, including the fact that Lewis started our Masters in Creative Writing. Lewis introduced the Writer in Residence program, which now bears his name. He initiated the Nancy Thorpe Prize in Poetry for High School Students, a contest that continues today. He co-founded the Hollands Critic and was the originator and driving force behind the Phi Beta Kappa chapter at Hollands. But more than that, he honored and developed women's voices and helped them tell their stories as he inspired cordial, respectful, lifelong relationships with the students he mentored, both as writers and as friends. When he left Hollins in 1967 to accept a position at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the editors of the student newspaper, The Columns, published a tribute to him in which they wrote, as is the good case with all teachers and advisors who touch our lives, he has greatly influenced and inspired his students. It is perhaps in these personal relationships with his students for the last 10 years that his efforts are the most meaningful and lasting. But actually, we can't wait until tomorrow when Louis D., cigar in mouth, will point out the spelling mistakes, the bumping headlines, the 50 cent word where a 10 cent word would have been better, and all the other imperfections. And it is these relationships with his students that indeed lasted a lifetime. Look at this theater today, which looks like the Hall of Fame of Southern writers, scholars, publishers, and journalists, all related back in some way to Lewis Rubin. Or consider this note from Suzanne McCormick Taylor, class of 64, who could not be with us today, but has invited me to share the following. You know that question, asking for passwords in order to access your bank account? You know, you've always got to give your password to get any kind of information. Well, my password is always Reuben. <laughs> I think Lewis would have loved that. Even though I'm not a real writer, Lewis reminded me that I use what I learned every day, and that was the endorsement I needed and cherished. And indeed, Lewis's words himself perhaps best capture it, as he talks about the community at Hollands, describing this Hollands community as something that belongs to Hollands and belongs to each of us. This is not a place where one goes to school or where one teaches, but it is a place that becomes part of your lives and ours. And indeed, Louis Rubin, 
You belong to us, but Holland's surely belongs to you. You have made this place the community it is. You have touched and enriched our lives. And truly, we belong to you, just as you belong to us. Thank you for being with us as we celebrate Lewis's life today, hearing from so many of his former students. And let us begin with our chaplain, Jenny Call. Jenny? Would you please join your hearts with me in prayer? Holy One, we gather together as a community in memory and in celebration of the life of Louis Rubin. We give thanks for the blessing of his life and pray that the light of that life will continue to shine in memories and music, words and writings, in the legacy he created, and in the lives of those he has inspired. May our time together be a reflection of our gratitude and love. As you make peace in heaven, make peace within our grieving hearts. Amen. We are so glad to have so many of you who are present today to share your memories and your time. And I ask that as you come up to share, you'll come up this way on these steps and then exit on the other side. And we'll go one right after another. Thank you. I'm sitting at my desk and saw right beside my phone a change of address card from my brother Lewis. And it came as an interestingly printed postcard dated July 5th, 2013. It was Lewis, as usual, relying on the printed word rather than the newfangled digital word, consistently. But it signaled to me to prepare myself for a loss. Until the odds were so stacked that he just couldn't win, Lewis resisted becoming dependent on others by moving into the assisted living quarters at Galloway Ridge, where his wife Eva had already entered give up his bird feeder and faithful hound and cluttered library and kitchen and his car? No way. So when I received that card, I knew my brother Lewis, whom I so admired and loved, was mortal after all. I remember once sending him a bunch of poems I wrote. Many of you would identify with the kind of answer he gave. Not trashing my head attempt, but saying something like, well, let me read you what he actually said. September 23rd, 1991. Dear Manny, I enjoyed reading your poems. I don't know what to say about them. I have to distinguish in my mind between my brother's emotions as he expresses them, which are of much interest to me and mean much and the literary artifacts made out of language and images and form, which have to be looked at in terms of what they recreate for readers, persons who share none of the particular experiences or family emotions. Well, Manning, you're not, at age 64, that was a long time ago, writing poems in order to be a poet and get them published and so forth. You're writing to express your emotions and thoughts on things near and dear to you to figure out what you feel and think about them. And that's a very worthwhile thing to do. And since I'm your brother and a great deal of your experience is close to me, it comes across to me very movingly and successfully. So I'm glad you sent them along. In other words, you ain't a poet, Bob, but I love you. <laughs> Growing up in Charleston, Lewis was a lover of baseball. He wrote about it, he organized leagues and teams for youngsters, and he played in and managed some of them. But Lewis was not that well coordinated to be a good player, but he knew I was. I was only four feet six until I was 15. My nickname, which still scars me, was Shrimpy Rubin. I could hit any pitch thrown to me, and uh, Lewis knew it. So, at a crucial point in the game, he would put me in the center field so I could come to bat. And the opposing pitcher would uh, look and say, oh, what a cute little guy, and sort of throw a gentle pitch 
and I would knock it out of the park and score the winning runs. Now, you would think someone as crafty as that would also be crafty in business and make Algonquin a financial excess for himself and Shannon. But Lewis was always more interested in the almighty word than the almighty dollar. So he struggled along for many years while helping others who were also devotees of the word. Just as he encouraged many of you, he encouraged me to use my grades and my Phi Beta Kappa at the University of Richmond to come to Johns Hopkins on a fellowship and get my master's. Don't waste it, he commanded. So I obeyed. The first semester, I roomed with Lewis, and at night, on uh, opposite sides of the night table, we would be reading. And he would flip through the pages, flip, 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 five times faster than what I was reading. Now, not only was the speed intimidating, but you ask him about what he was reading five years later, and he would quote it verbatim. He was my source for things that happened in my childhood in Charleston. I find myself almost every day trying to recall something and thinking, oh, i got to ask Lewis. And I then realize I can't. And that hurts. I remember when he and Eva were married, they compromised on a Unitarian uh, wedding in Baltimore. And when the minister began, and the night has a thousand eyes, both their pairs of eyes were rolling and I had to bite my lip. <laughs> Lewis used to love exchanging jokes with me, and especially loved my jokes in dialect about old Jewish folks. He particularly liked the one about Sam Lapidus, Cleveland, Ohio. His guffaw would early on shake the phone and try to make my hearing as tentative as his was becoming. It was a sad day when I realized that I could no longer share jokes with him on the phone because his hearing was so bad he couldn't hear the punchlines. Now, for you younger folks in the audience, the star of the 1949 Rodgers and Hammerstein musical South Pacific was Ezio Pinza. He was known by all especially for his Enchanted Evening song. It ran for five years and had several reruns and movies. And uh, so remember that, okay? Now, here's how the Sam Lapidus joke went. Pulling up to the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York, a taxi stopped, and a gentleman got out. As he was reaching for his bag, a porter ran up and grabbed it and said, Has your pizza here at our hotel? What an honor. He said, I'm Sam Lapidus, Cleveland, Ohio. He went to the front desk, and the same thing. The clerk said, oh, Mr. Pizza, what an honor. I've seen your show five times. Welcome. He says, Sam Lapidus, Cleveland, Ohio. Same thing in the elevator. The porter said the same thing, and he says, Sam Lapidus, Cleveland, Ohio. When he got in his room, he heard a noise in the bathroom, and he opened the door, and out of the shower stepped this beautiful young blonde woman, and she says, oh, Am I dreaming? He says, Hansel Pizza? He says, Sam, Sam Enchanted Evening, you will meet a stranger. Now, I know I'm supposed to say, Lewis, can you hear that? But neither Lewis nor I believe that he's hovering, like we used to joke about our father, Lewis D. Rubin Sr., the weather wizard of Richmond. When nasty clouds would come across the sky and bring rain or wind or snow to mess up whatever it was we were doing, Lewis would shout gleefully, Here he comes across Mauna Law with the ashes on his tail. But Lewis is here. His DNA is here in Robert and Raoul and Bill and young Eva. And in the hippocampuses, of all those creative geniuses here and elsewhere, whom Lewis taught and edited and loved. What? The plural is hippocampi? <laughs> <laughs> As 
Lewis would often jokingly say goodbye to our Aunt Dora in Charleston, Dodo as we called her. He called her Titanic, uh, based on, uh, shall we say, her stout form. When he would depart, he would say, fare thee well, Titanic, fare thee well. That from an 18th century song in which a lover bids goodbye when he's going off on a journey. So I say, fare thee well, dear brother, fare thee well. For if I had a friend on all this earth, you've been a friend to me. Now, I might have considered quoting Horatio and say, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. But we all know Lewis would quickly say, I trust you're referring to the Los Angeles angels. <laughs> I miss Lewis, and I always will. And it's comforting to know that you will too. Thank you. Fifty years ago, those of us in the class of 1967, and there are many of us here today, we met each other 50 years ago as freshmen here, and we met Louis Rubin for the first time. And for 50 years, he stayed among us, in many ways, the glue that held us together, individually and as a community. He was, among all of his many other talents, a builder of communities, such as this one, that comes together today to honor a life that really was too large and too generous and too magnificent to be measured. Taking the measure of this man is made all the more difficult because during his life he so stubbornly turned aside the many accolades he earned. He never let his accomplishments be about him. He was hard to honor, harder to praise, and hardest of all, I think, to thank. I was with him once when a poor interviewer <laughs> started off this way. Dr. Rubin, you're a writer, a musician, and a painter. And Lewis interrupted her and said, yes, I know, that's pretty amazing. It isn't everybody who can be mediocre in three genres. <laughs> in 1989, he won the O. Max Gardner Award, the only statewide honor given to a faculty member by the Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina. And they asked the honorees to write a little statement of a few paragraphs in the program for that honor. And Lewis wrote a rather amazing one. And at the end of it, he said that it's proper to deliver a message with a capital M and on these occasions. But he says message giving didn't come naturally to him. And so this is what he said instead. The only advice I have to offer anyone is to be lucky, like me. For consider the fact that for the major part of my adult lifetime, I have been paid to do exactly what I most enjoy doing, teaching, studying, reading, editing, helping young people to write, and writing. My students have become my friends. I have been blessed with an incomparable wife and two fine sons, and now, incredibly, merely for having allowed all those things to happen, I am being honored. Thanking Lewis personally was no easier for any of us. Sometimes I would try by singing a few words of a song that my father loved. He was like Lewis, and that he loved popular tunes and, and not so popular ones, and he could break into one just like Lewis did every time there was a conversation and anything came up that could remind him of a song, he would sing that song, my father and Lewis both. And my father loved one that I found out later was actually sung by Frank Sinatra. And when Lewis had done something for me, which he did too often to even count, I would sing him the first words of that song. You made me what I am today, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> And he would, of course, always furrow the brow, roll the blue eyes, stick the lower lip out, point the finger, and say, don't you blame me. You brought it on yourself. <laughs> <sighs> but 
whoever was responsible, all I know is that for 50 years, Lewis has been in all our lives in a uniformly wonderful and astonishing way. When I was a freshman, I went to him crying that I had to get out of Grace Ship Rose swimming class. <laughs> he got me out with the mild comment that, quote, Grace tends to have the sensitivity of a fence post. <laughs> When I took a fellow I was dating to meet him, a man who did love and still loves to fish, he took me aside to say in the lingo that he and my husband John both loved, I think this one is a keeper. In 1991, when my mother died 22 years ago, Lewis wrote a letter to me in which he said, I will tell you this from my own experience that once the immediate pain attendant on her death goes away, the reality of that lifelong experience of love becomes far, far more important than the fact that it isn't there anymore. And you'll never lose that. It will be as real to you 25 years from now as it is now. It is yours to keep and hold and cherish for as long as you live. How true indeed is that? In 1969, when I was a graduate student at UNC, he didn't look scandalized or even mildly surprised when I went to him and said, the only thing I cared about enough in graduate school to write a dissertation on was Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Not only that, but he let me do it. <laughs> uh, so, in all of those ways, over all of those years, one of the last times I saw him, we were both muttering about our ailments, and we both broke into the proof Rockian words, I am old, I am old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. And I said, with great boldness, I guess, hey, Lewis, you're not old, you're beyond old. <laughs> he sort of liked that, but he said, yeah, but since he always had to have the last word, you know what that means, don't you? And I said, no, what does it mean? He says, I'll always be ahead of you. <laughs> Boy. Um, in the 50 years since we arrived here, of course, we have all changed. And of course, that's what college does. It changes you. But we weren't just changed, the class of 1967 and those before. And sadly, not those after since he left with us in 1967. We weren't just changed. We were revolutionized. And we were revolutionized because of an ideology of Lewis. As Lewis wasn't an ideologue about anything, I don't think, but he was, I think, about this one thing, and I think it's what, what um, made our own lives, those of us here today, so in, incredibly rich. He had this amazing idea that if you really wanted to do something, there was no reason not to do it. Um, think about his own life. So he wants to do a dissertation on Thomas Wolfe at Johns Hopkins University. Well, the English department, number one, doesn't think Thomas Wolfe deserving of a dissertation. He's just died after all. And Lewis has the temerity to think that he wants to tie Thomas Wolfe to something called Southern literature. And there isn't such a thing. Um, so what does Lewis do? Well, he goes and gets the premier Southern historian in the nation, C. Van Woodward, and he gets C. Van Woodward and his friend Elliot Coleman, a poet, to help him do that dissertation, which establishes the importance of Thomas Wolfe and also becomes the genesis of the study of Southern literature, which Louis Rubin had more to do with than any man living on this earth. Then what does he do? He gets a job at a small women's college, he wants to write, he wants other people who want to write, to write. And so what does he do? Within two years, he establishes a co-ed master's program in creative writing, and the rest is history. He goes to a large, prestigious Southern University, and there are no African-American professors there in 1967. Within two years, he gets them to hire a twofer two of the premier African-American professors anywhere, Blyden and Roberta Jackson. And the rest for UNC, Chapel Hill, is history. He goes to MLA in New York on the train and comes
comes home, and while he's on the train home, I better let Shannon tell this one. He's just really tired of New York publishing. He doesn't understand they will not publish good writers unless they write that New York stuff. So what does he do? Well, Shannon can tell you. But it starts in his garage. If you want to do it, there's no reason not to do it. He wants a wooden boat. He can't find one. He built one and has a flotilla for its christening. Last but not least, he loses his hearing aids overboard on a lake while he's fishing. Does he despair? No. He goes and hires a diver. Okay, the last one was an abysmal failure. The only one I know of. The hearing aids remain in the bottom of that lake. Still. How about us? I want to end by thinking just a little bit about his teaching. And I found his best statement about teaching, uh, a, 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 a statement that describes his teaching from Eva Rubin, a wonderful painter who has a wonderful teacher. And uh, in an interview, somebody asked her about the influence of her painting teacher on her. And Eva, who was a terrific teacher of political science, my colleague at NC State University, Eva said about Jane Filer, she always finds something to like. Finding something to like is the story of what a good teacher does. You have to find the value in what people are saying or doing. The essence of teaching is making people feel they can do it and that they have something to offer. And that's Eva as a teacher. That's Lewis as a teacher. Lewis had another ideology, I think, that he put upon us, don't just sit there, do something. And then he would say, remember, he never told us goodbye. No. You know what he said? He said, be good. <laughs> be good. And now I think I understand what he, what he meant by that fully. Not just go be a good girl, he knew better than that. <laughs> but be good at what you do. Want to be good and be good. Lewis, we're being good today. We're trying hard to be good and we are good. And that's because we were taught, encouraged, admonished, not ever bullied, and loved by Lewis Ribbon. Thank you. Well, this is going to be, I think, very short and very personal. Um, I, I'll just read it. Lewis Rubin was a great, great teacher who absolutely changed my life as he has changed so many others. In fact, it is probable that I never would have become a writer at all if I had not encountered him exactly when I did, because I was a wild girl, flying off in all directions. And I'm not sure what would have happened to me, but I do know that if I'm ever able to write anything real or beautiful or honest or anything that ever speaks truly about the human condition, it will be due to this man. He wanted the best we had. He called it up, and he's still doing it. Thank you, Lewis. Although I was taught as a little Southern boy that if I told stories, I was likely to get a switch. I figured the best way to honor Lewis is not to recite his wonders, which we all know, but to tell you two stories. And they're the kind of stories that little boys might get switched for, because they're not entirely true. <laughs> but then most, most stories are fictions, right? These two stories are called, one, How I Got My Job at Holland's College, and two, Why Lewis Rubin Left Holland's College. How I got my job at Holland's College. I knew who Lewis Rubin was. 
I'd seen him once beaming benignly upon, down upon Erskine Caldwell while he was reading at the University of Virginia, and I assume now that Lewis had brought a group of students over to hear Caldwell. I knew that Lester Berlin in the English department at UVA had a picture of Lewis in the center of the dartboard in his office. <laughs> I actually met Louis Rubin when I interviewed at the MLA a number of students in the cold December of 1963. And I do not recall anything about that interview except I don't think it went particularly well. Coming back on the train to Virginia, uh, Louis passed down the aisle of the car I was in and remembered my face and we had a chat. I was reading a little paperback biography of Lyndon Johnson who had just become president. And I always figured the reasons I was hired at Hollins was A, Lewis saw me on a train and B, he was open to eccentricity. I later learned another version of the story. It seems that between the interview in the hotel in Chicago and our meeting on the train, Lewis had received a letter from my mentor, office mate, and dear friend George Garrett. That in that letter, he extolled my high qualities and urged Lewis to hire me. But George was not one to, shall we say, stick to the truth when he wanted something good to happen to somebody. So he added a couple of stretchers. The first one was, Richard is probably gay, so he won't be chasing the girls. <laughs> and the second one was, he is a world-class clarinetist. <laughs> And you'll love to have him in the hymn <laughs> Oh, God. Well, I had played the clarinet. It was funny that George remembered, but it had been 10 years since I picked one up, and I couldn't have played the note. And so I can tell you that the letter doesn't, to my knowledge, exist in any archive. So I'm not even sure of what it said. But... Lewis did ask me to join the handbook. As for the rest of the story, we'll let that go. <laughs> story number two, why Lewis left Hollins College. In the fall or early spring of 1966-67, Lewis noticed that he was having a little trouble hearing. So he went for the first time to an eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist to have his hearing checked. And when they finished all the little beeping noises and raise your finger and, and all that, the man says, well, uh, Mr. Rubin, you are beginning to lose your hearing, but it really shouldn't cause you any difficulty. And Lewis said, why is that? He said, well, in the range where your hearing has gotten bad, really the only thing that fits in that range is the voices of young women. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Lewis left Hollins. <laughs> God bless Lewis and his memory and all of you. In 2002, the venerable literary journal the Southern Review, uh, dedicated its autumn uh, edition to a celebration of Lewis and his wide influence on all aspects of Southern literature. Uh, I am going to read a little bit from my contribution to that issue. The title of the essay is, quote, I want you to think about something, end of quote. Louis D. Rubin, Jr. and the Establishment of Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill. <clears throat> I like to think of myself as the original Hollins Rubin groupie. 
At fall registration in 1957, he introduced himself to me, not as the new English lit professor he was, but as a fellow Charlestonian, and proceeded to turn my life in a new direction. All I knew about myself then was that I liked to read and wanted to get married as soon as possible, <laughs> though there was no immediate candidate for the latter goal. With no real plan in mind, I took as many English courses as were allowed, and a couple more that Lewis let me into. As the semesters passed, I decided I would leave my mark at Hollins by being a student government wonk. I decided that I wanted to be president of House Board. Lewis rolled those eyes and persuaded me to also edit cargoes. He mentioned a resume and how interviewers for publishing jobs would focus on editorial experience rather than on dorm presidency. <laughs> publishing? Lewis was introducing a vista of life after college that I had not considered. And there was no real interruption in his influence on my life in what is now the last 50, gosh, four uh, years since my graduation in 1960. Lewis wrote on my behalf 10 letters to people he knew in publishing and when in the late 1960s I began slowly to rise in the editorial ranks at Houghton Mifflin's trade department, he sent his best writing students of the time, Sylvia Wilkinson and Lee Smith, my way. I bought Sylvia's first book, but, and this is to my everlasting shame, turned down Lee's. But later we got back. <clears throat> on New Year's Day, 1982, Lewis wrote me the most significant letter of all. The key paragraph began, quote, I want you to think about something, not do anything, but just think about it so that if I do go ahead, you might have some ideas. I am convinced, A, that publishing literary fiction is dying in the NYC, and B, it can be done even so. I am, therefore, toying with the idea of doing it myself. And even, that's the end of the quote, and even though I was only supposed to be thinking about it, he closed his letter with, quote, would you like to be involved in such a thing with me? By January 3, my affirmative letter was in the mail. By January 24th, he had named the company gathered a staff of four, and created a letterhead on which he wrote me to say, you see by the above, we are, all caps. This is really going to be fun. Somehow, Lewis single-handedly rounded up potential stockholders and kept them interested in this dream of his until he could force the wheels to turn and chug out some stock offering forms, and finally, the actual certificates. I framed mine. With Lewis at the helm, working for Algonquin Books was a job with lots of drama. He never pulled punches. His engagement in and passion for the thing we were undertaking were always in play. When it came to Algonquin, he was incapable of a dispassionate response. His letters, as you all know, are many and amazing. Amazingly long, insightful, emotional, joyous, disgruntled, furious, contrite, triumphant. Lewis's vision of Algonquin's mission was succinctly stated in his last company newsletter, and I quote, Algonquin's is a policy of searching out and publishing work of the best, most interesting writers available, known and unknown, with a prime regard for high literary quality. That's the end of the quote. 
Though his visits to the Algonquin offices ended long, long ago, he kept us on that path. How? Simply by having set before us such a simple and rewarding mission to publish good books by good writers, known and unknown. Thank you, and thank you, Lewis. I had a different relationship with Lewis from most speakers today, even though I was his student in both American Lit and Creative Writing, his first year at Collins, which was my last year. You all know about his fabled memory for everything his students ever wrote, and that is not the respect in which my relationship is different. He never did forget the only short story I turned in for that creative writing class back in 1958. I honestly don't remember what he said about it then. Mercifully little, I suspect. In later years, though, he loved to mention my story, called Farewell, Fair Lady, as a great example of why it was a good thing I chose a career writing nonfiction. <laughs> Can any other student report that Lewis Rubin disparaged her work? Also, for almost a decade, starting in the late 1980s, I was Lewis and Eva's neighbor. I moved to Chapel Hill from close quarters New York City, where you devoutly don't want to know your neighbor and certainly would never be neighborly to one. So when I found the house of my dreams, and it was next door to the Rubens, I called Lewis to ask if he minded my moving in so close. He replied, not skipping a beat, not as long as you don't throw your liquor bottles at my dog. <laughs> that dog, by the way, was Albert. To my mind, the best of a questionable lot. <laughs> One night, shortly after I moved next door, I managed to lock myself out of my house by fastening the screen door at the front and then going out the back door, to which I had no key. Knowing no one well enough to call at midnight when I returned from somewhere to discover the situation, I slept at the Carolina Inn and called Lewis the next day for a locksmith recommendation. He insisted that I come home at once. He could open the screen and get me in. I resisted as long as I politely could. Lewis had never struck me as handy. <laughs> to my great surprise, he met me at my front door with, I swear, a toolkit and proceeded to take the screen off the hinges quite expertly so that I could use my key that opened the front door. Lewis had many secret talents. I loved almost everything about Lewis, his smile, his clothes, the way he and Eva were together. The initial hook, though, was his voice. On the first day of class in American Lit, Maybe the first time I ever saw him, he read the whole hour from Thomas Wolfe's novella, The Lost Boy. That warm, velvety voice, the low country accent, cast a spell over the classroom. Light came and went and came again. The booming strokes of, the three, of three o'clock beat out across the town and thronging bronze from the courthouse bell. Light winds of April blew the fountain out in rainbow sheets, and the plume returned and pulsed as Grover turned into the square. Nobody could say Grover the way Lewis did. His greatest gift to me was that he connected me and kept me connected to so many other students of his who became my friends and whose husbands are my friends. Shortly after I arrived in Chapel Hill in 1986, before I moved next door, he and Eva had me over to their house for a drink with Lee Smith and Hal Crowler, neither of whom I had ever met. 
and then took all of us out to the fanciest, most expensive restaurant around. From the time he left Hollins, Lewis ran a personal alumni association of former students and was always finding excuses to get us together. He was a fabulous host, another talent not so secret. My connection to these women, mostly younger, and their families has made me a happier, <laughs> not at this moment, a happier and smarter person. Thank you, Lewis. And thank you, all of his loyal alums. Well, my father started teaching here at Hollins in September, I guess, of 57. I was born in July of 58, so if you work backwards from there, about, about the first month. <laughs> Uh, my earliest memories, uh, though we'd lived in Fincastle at first, were, were growing up on Faculty Road. And I have uh, two memories that I can date pretty precisely. One is uh, when Jake Wheeler ran for Congress, and he, his kids handed out bumper stickers, which I thought was really cool. And they had his uh, name on there and a ship's wheel. Uh, and then when Jake lost, to Richard Poff, the Republican, for about the next two years after that. Every time I would see him leading a group around on campus, I would yell, I'm sorry, Poff, meet you, Mr. Wheeler, <laughs> which he no doubt appreciated. <laughs> the, the other memory that I can date, and I can date it precisely, is from 1963, and it is in an odd way connected to why we're gathered here today. I was five and was playing in the front yard of my house up on Faculty Row with my best friend, Mike Hanna. And Mike's sister, Tad, his older sister, uh, was walking up the Faculty Row. And this, she was, this was unusual because she was usually at school at this time of the day. And what's more, she was crying. And we said, what's the matter? And she said, uh, President Kennedy has been shot. And I went inside to tell my mom, and she was already watching the TV. Um, now, most of the people my age or older can remember where they were when they got the news that day. Uh, most of those younger than me, even my brother, don't remember that. So it's sort of a end date, end marker for their inclusion in the boomer generation. Um, do you remember Kennedy's death? Then, okay, we can talk. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute and explain why I think it's relevant, but if you'll indulge me for just a second, I'll, I, I'll talk a little bit about what it was like being a kid here at Hollands and some memories of uh, growing up with Lewis as my dad. I remember visiting him at his office in Bradley Hall, where he had a dictaphone with red acetate rolls, and he would let me and my brother record our voices on it, which we thought was amazingly cool. Um, I remember how he would draft all his students as our babysitters. Uh, we probably have a higher percentage of well-published babysitters than most, most kids do. Um, I remember him printing documents down in the basement on a printing press that was called the Tinker Press. And he would often come right home from Bradley Hall and go right down and start printing, still in his white dress shirt. And of course this would get stained with ink, and my mother get furious at him, and my mother was a pretty good illustrator, and she would draw posters of these sad-looking stained white shirts saying, I was once a good white shirt, <laughs> to, to remind me. Um, I remember going to watch him and my mother process in the cap and gown procession on May Day, when all the students dressed up in their spring finery. Um, I remember his students dropping by in wild costumes for Halloween. And I remember him ordering me one day to run around to the back of the house where his printing press was and fetch a machine that he'd left down there. I went down there and it was my first bicycle. Um, and so that, that, those are the sort of things that I, I remember. Oh, I also, since we're here, I remember a Faculty Follies skit where uh, they were uh, performing um, and I was asked to stand behind the curtains, and they had a machine on stage 
I think this is around Cotillion, and the Holland student comes up and it's a vending machine and she's picking her date and she pulls one lever and it's Washington Lay, another it's Rono College, and another it's some other thing. But anyway, I think that in this case they pull the Washington and Lee le le lever and it out comes me at age eight, <laughs> sucking my thumb, <laughs> holding a balloon. Although well, those are a child's memories and they're pretty idyllic. Um, and make no mistake, Hollins was an idyllic place to grow up. Uh, I was one of the faculty brats and had the run of the campus. Uh, these days, we former faculty brats have a Facebook page where we share old pictures with each other. But our family didn't stay here at Hollins. We moved to Chapel Hill in 1967, and Chapel Hill is where I grew up. And my memories of Chapel Hill are much more equivocal and my memories of Hollins. Um, Chapel Hill was the real world with hard lessons. And um, Lewis had moved on to a major public university where he had the chance to shape its scholarly agenda to work with doctoral students, uh, where he had a lighting teach, lighter teaching load and less committee work, uh, more opportunity to publish, better connections. Um, and he didn't have to teach as much, teach undergraduates as often. Um, so it, you can see the, the practical reasons why he might have gone there. And with that in mind, it might seem a little odd that we're here today celebrating him when he was really only here for 10 years. Um, to be sure, he accomplished a lot while he was here, but, but including founding the creative writing program, but by now, the always gracious Richard Dillard must be heartily sick on some le at some level of hearing the periodic tributes to Lewis when it's Richard and his colleagues like Gene Larson and Kathy Heinkla, who for the last 40 years have done the heavy lifting of this program and have made it a, a world-renowned program, and uh, who've seen it transition to an MFA program and the expansion to other writing disciplines. And, and who could blame them if they um, look back and say, why are we still talking about this guy uh, all these years? Yet, when you think about it, it all makes perfect sense. Lewis left Hollins in 1967, which you will remember was the Summer of Love. Uh, the Monterey Pop Festival that year, Hair, are you going to San Francisco? In the next that year, we'd see the Beatles, uh, the, the White Album, the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the riots in Chicago, murders of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, emergence of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and um, forced busing in the South and all the things that we're still fighting about today. And those days didn't leave Hollins untouched either. Those May Day celebrations I remember so fondly when the faculty processed and students dressed up and the May Queen and her court of virgins <laughs> or, well, they were supposed to be virgins, um, would dance around a giant erect pole in the quad, and that's going to survive 19, late 60s and early 70s feminism? I don't think so. Um, was the idea of going to college, do you get well-educated before getting married, going to survive? No, I don't think so. Uh, was the system going to be remain unchanged where a mostly male faculty told young women what to do? I don't think so. Um, was the very notion of a private women's college and its relevance in the modern world going to go unchallenged? And what was going to happen when the graduates left Hollins and found glass ceilings and encountered sexism in the workplace? Maybe Lewis left Hollins just in time. <laughs> the weekend in November when Lewis died was the weekend when the press was commemorating the 50th year of President Kennedy's assassination. Uh, see, I told you I'd get back to it. Um, and as we were dealing with his funeral arrangements and answering calls and emails about his life, the weekend news shows were revisiting the events in Dallas in 1963 and the end of Camelot. Now, of course, we know that Camelot really wasn't Camelot. We know that Jack slept around and cheated on Jackie, and we know that some of those adorable Kennedy children grew up to live very troubled lives. So, and yet, 
as the historian Robert Dalek was saying on Sunday morning, which devoted a whole whole program to that 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 period, there was something true about the Camelot myth. It really was a time when we believed and when everything seemed possible and when many great things were started. The fact that Kennedy was cut down just when it all seemed to, within reach did not ultimately end that sense of possibility. In fact, it, it sort of underlined it. He was not the change himself. He was a symbol of the change, a martyr for the change. He spoke for the generation, but in the end it was the generation that was the change, not the president. And the students who moved through Hollands when Lewis was here were students of that generation. The generation of Camelot in a very real way. I mean, when he came here in 1957, the, the students who were freshmen then would have been about 23 or 24 when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, the freshmen who were there the year Kennedy was shot were the ones who, were, who graduated with him in 1967. Um, it was a time when roles were changing and doors were cracking open and light was shining through them and in believing in those students in showing them their strengths and abilities in the new light and pointing them toward a life of ideas and engagement they maybe hadn't considered Lewis was really an agent for that change but those students were the change they may look back on Lewis and on Hollands with gratitude but they were the ones who made their new lives in a new America happen. Now, to be sure, Lewis's support and guidance for his students was very real, and he continued to encourage and support them throughout his career. But he was taken away from Hollands in much the same way that Kennedy was taken away from America. And we are here today because we remember the promise and the possibility he offered as much as the hard work of actually achieving those things. If Lewis had stayed at Hollands into, his, into the 70s and 80s and 90s in the way that his colleagues John Moore and Lex Allen and Jesse Zeldin did, well, perhaps we wouldn't be gathered here today. Perhaps Lewis would have been come to take, take, be taken somewhat for granted. Uh, a beloved professor who grew old while his students remained always energetic 18 to 21 year old. Maybe he would, fairly or unfairly, have come to be seen as just another part of Hollands, as unchanging as the millstones on the quad. Maybe, on a certain level, he recognized that, and that's why he left. And maybe that's why he left UNC after two decades for Algonquin Books. He believed in the possibilities and in the future, and that was his great love and, and talent was recognizing that. He never wanted to be a guardian of the way it had always been done. Uh, he wanted to open doors, not close them. Now, Hollands will always be, to me, my childhood home, and my father will be not a mentor who held the keys to the treasure chests of language and literature and the world of publishing, but rather the gruff, somewhat incomprehensible man who worked in down in Bradley and who played harmonica in the Hambones. Um, or who cussed when the bro boat broke down in the summer heat, or who stuck up the house with strong cigars, or threw tennis balls for the dog. Nevertheless, I've been amazed and touched and moved by the outpouring of affection for him. And I thank all of you who've come today to honor his memory. I'll leave you with the following thought. I said earlier that Hollands was the setting of, for my childhood, but Chapel Hill was where I grew up. I wonder if that's not true for many of his students, too. If the powerful feelings that Lewis's students have for him are, in a way, that also the feelings of adults looking back on an idyllic part of their lives when anything seemed possible. That possibility was given form and manifested here, working through Lewis's agency, but it remains a place of beginnings. He certainly took great pride in his students' accomplishments. Doubtless, some of, some of that was self-congratulation. He was only human in all, after all, and he loved being made much of and feted and fussed over. He would love this, though he would make some self-deprecating remark about it being just so much fiction by fiction writers. <laughs> 
But I know he loved his students too, and he, just as I know he loved me and loved my brother and he loved his grandchildren. More than that, I am certain that he truly admired his students' accomplishments on their own terms and deeply respected the hard work that went into making those accomplishments real. For finally he knew that he did not accomplish those things for them, they accomplished them for themselves. In the end, he did leave Hollins, but Hollins was still a part of him, as he was guiding PhD students at UNC and editing aspiring writers in Algonquin books. Hollins changed him too. He did, as I have said, go on to bigger things, but not, I think, to better things. Um, saying goodbye to him now means saying goodbye to that part of us for whom this campus was a safe, encouraging place in which to begin our journey into the big, scary world beyond the front gates. I guess saying goodbye to him means that it's about time we learn to be grown-ups. I'm not sure I'm ready. Are you? Stunk up the house with cigars. Um, I am a Rita Wilby Muncy, class of 67. I was not an English major, and neither was my sister, who uh, came here. She was a Patricia Wilkie Ebrahimi, class of 62. She could not be here today because she lives in India, and that was just a little bit too far. Uh, I'm going to read a memory that she uh, submitted. Patty, that was my sister, she was a class of 62, but she graduated in 61. It took her three years. Uh, Dr. Rubin was her advisor. He was the advisor for her class. So this dates back to that time. And the reason I pointed out the cigars was because at that time, Patty and I and our family were living in Cuba. She came to Hollands from Cuba. So she had a different perspective. She came from a different place, a different time. And we'll go back there now. Here's what she wrote. One thing Louis Rubin did for me. Mr. Rubin, as he was known to me in 1958, when I arrived at Hollands from my home in Cuba, was my advisor. At our first meeting, he told me I should be an English major but helped me figure out how to take a lot of French literature courses from Mr. Lucy Rand instead. Then came the Cuban Revolution, January 1, 1959. And shortly after that, the threat of an embargo against the island was in the news. And that's how I became Mr. Rubin's cigar mule for the, <laughs> for the, two, rem <laughs> for the two remaining trips I made home. I learned about variety in tobacco from a true cigar connoisseur. When I returned to Havana for the first time after 38 years away, I walked, we couldn't go there before that. I walked around the streets of Old Havana and found one of the specialized cigar stores Mr. Rubin's list had taken me to. They were no longer selling cigars. But the same glass vitrines and mahogany cabinets were still in place that my 17-year-old eyes had seen on that long-ago errand. One thing Louis Rubin did for me was to teach me about the almost infinite variety in cigars and the tobacco that went into making them. His shopping list was quite specific. Two of this, and three Ateukman, and two more that came in little metal tubes, and maybe six of another exotic variety. I had to go to three stores on the first shopping trip. The sales clerks told me, Este Americano you're shopping for was only the best. Of course he had prepared me with, Now don't go accepting any substitutes. If they don't have this one, buy me two more of that one. When I would return to Hollands with the right cigars, his eyes would sparkle with joy. What an adventure he sent me on. I'll never forget him. And he was right. I should have been an English major. But revolutions have a way of changing life goals and giving unusual shopping lists to a young woman. Thank you.
It's incredible to me to think how generous Lewis was with his time for so many. It's incredible that he corresponded with me for more than 40 years. The gem that I brought to share today comes from about 20 years ago. Living alone for a while then, I had achieved, I thought, the stage of midlife called being your own grown-up, somewhat. One time, driving my old heap across Virginia when I was looking for a better job, I blew off a forecast of heavy snow. In March? That sounded hyped. So I blundered head-on into the blizzard of March 1993 did a full circle spin on the interstate. No fun. But later, since I survived it, it made a good story to tell. And of course, I wrote to Lewis about it. His answer reads in part, as for your escapades on icy roads, you're fortunate to have emerged so harmlessly. Next time, you had better listen to the Weather Bureau. They called that storm and predicted how bad it was likely to be several days ahead. These days, they are quite accurate. <laughs> what I do every November is have a set of steel-studded snow tires put on my car's drive wheels. They can handle ice. The only cost is having them put on and taken off. Moreover, they have the fortunate effect of keeping the ice and snow away from these parts, meaning in North Carolina. It hasn't iced up or snowed in three years. In the same letter, he gave me a job search tip that I wonder now why I didn't follow. <laughs> Uh, as I look at the people assembled here, I'm really struck by the many different ways we are following in Lewis's footsteps. Wyndham Robertson, Chris Edwards, and I were journalists. Lee Smith and Katie Letcher Lyle are novelists. There are at least three professors of American literature specializing in Southern Lit. Cindy Hardwick McKeithen and Ann Jones are here today. Shannon Ravenel and Mary Flynn are publication editors and publishers. I'm sure there are more examples, and I'm sorry if I left out someone here, but this tendency to emulate Lois is no accident. Here's what happened to me. When I graduated from Hollins, I had no idea of what to do next. Lewis pointed me to a job in journalism. I had been the editor of the Hollins columns but it never occurred to me to be a journalist. I was in Washington, so he gave me introductions to four or five of his old friends from his days as a journalist. I happened to interview first at the old Washington Star, then it was the number one newspaper in Washington, and that was the start of an 11 year stay there. I eventually became the top elected leader of the journalism union at the Star, and an assistant metropolitan editor, two, two posts that was unusual for women to have in those days. I moved on to other jobs over the next 42 years, um, and they added up to a truly satisfying career in journalism. I will forever be grateful for the great start Lewis gave me, as he gave so many of you. Class of 63, and you'll find out why I have on my Algonquin bookshelf. In 1983, I was 42 years old. My children were teenagers, and I was desperately looking for something interesting to do. One day, I was scanning the help warning ads in the Chapel Hill newspaper when I saw an ad Computer Technician Warning, Brightly Books. I had heard that Lewis Rubin was starting a publishing company, so I took a deep breath and called the number. Mr. Rubin, I said, 
This is Mimi Ryan now I found and I don't know anything about computers, but I would love to work for your publishing company. At five o'clock that afternoon, I had a job as Girl Friday for Brightleaf Books, soon to be Algonquin Books of Chapel Hill. In 1985, I had been promoted to Director of Publicity of Algonquin Books. Lewis and I were in Atlanta at a book conference. I had organized a dinner with Clyde Edgerton, Jill McCorkle, and Diane O'Brien of the Atlanta Constitution. At one point, Clyde turned to me and said, Mimi, I didn't know you were an English major at Hollins. And I said, oh, I wasn't one of the golden girls. I was a struggling BC student. And Lewis turned to me and he said, and look at you now. <laughs> so uh, we have a really beautiful photograph of, on the front of our programs today. I'm going to suggest and talk about a different expression that sometimes you could see on Louis Rubin's face. I'm guessing everyone who knew Louis D. Rubin Jr. remembers how gruff he could seem, even fierce. He would frown, furrow that massive eyebrow, jut out his jaw, raise a finger pointing somewhere, possibly at you, and then pronounce. It could be anything. Proust tasted that madeleine and got from it the entire seven volumes of La Recherche de Tempédu. Mark Twain was as divided as his name. My father was an uncannily accurate weatherman man in Richmond, Virginia. I am not your father. <laughs> now, for a lot of the time I was at Collins, I was scared. I was scared that I wouldn't do as well as I thought I should. That would be perfectly. I was scared that not one single student would like me, certainly not the real me, whoever that was. I was scared that my professors would, would see that I was an intellectual fraud. And I was scared that after two years in a girls' boarding school, I would be a complete failure with college boys. Scared of all these, yes, but I was terrified of only one person, Louis Rubin. He was so fierce. I tried to stay out of range of that ancient mariner. Of course, I had no idea I could write. I had no talent and no imagination, so I didn't even consider taking Mr. Rubin's creative writing course. As a result, unlike Nancy and Lee and Cindy and Annie and Anne, I never had the chance to see more sides to Mr. Rubin, I still call him that in my head, and thus to place his fierceness in a context to understand it with some depth. Imagine my terror then when he called me into his office one day, told me to sit down, furrowed his brow, stuck out his jaw, raised his finger and pronounced the following. I want you to write a column for the Holland's Columns. I stammered something like, what? <laughs> what? No, I couldn't possibly do that. No, why? Why me? He relaxed his frown, smoothed his brow, moved back his jaw, and lowered his finger. He almost smiled. He said, because I think you'd be good at it. He laced his fingers together in front of him and said, now go to it. The long and short of it is that I did write that column every two weeks, mostly on deadline, and Head was the editor, so she remembers those days. So Mr. Rubin saved me from myself. He got me off my self-defeating butt and into writing. Only many years later did I recognize his terrifying directive to write that column as a gift of caring and his fierceness as a posture that might have been 
aimed as much at himself as it was at us. Periodically, he used to make the following pronouncement to us English majors at Holland's. You think I am your father. I am not your father. I don't want to be your father. Don't think of me as your father. <laughs> okay. He wasn't my father, but Mr. Newman was the most generous professor I've ever known and definitely the best at acting fierce. <laughs> that line about fathers just now <laughs> kills me because my little one minute speech is about fathers. When I was 16 and wanting to come to Hollins, and my father finally agreed to let a daughter be educated and paid the $1,350 to come here. I arrived at Hollins in the fall of 55, um, always knowing I wanted to be an English teacher. Um, my father muttered things about that wasn't a good idea, um, but I wanted to be an English teacher. So about a week after I got here, I got a postcard from my father that said, um, just don't be coming home with a lot of new ideas. <laughs> about two weeks after that, and of course everybody, your parents knew your grades in those days. About two weeks after that, I get this postcard saying, drop that humanities course and take something useful like typing. You're human enough already. <laughs> so I had to write back and say, it's required. <laughs> so, um, Two years later, Lewis came to Hollins. I was an English major. I, oh, in the meantime, I had taken one course in creative writing in which I got a D. I won't name the professor, but I was pretty discouraged, so that wasn't what I was going to be. I was still going to be an English teacher. So when Lewis arrived, I think that he told me I was the first student to come into his office that afternoon, and I was very curious about how old he was, and was he married, and did he have children, and all that. Um, but in the next year, Lewis told me I was a writer. He published my first poems that were ever published in the Roanoke Times in 1958. Um, I would get discouraged because I didn't think I was a very good writer, and in fact, I knew I wasn't. I'd gotten a D in creative writing, but he, he kept at it. When I graduated, he urged me to go to Johns Hopkins. Well, unfortunately, that took money. My father said, no, absolutely not. Um, I, was, I was then, Lewis got me a scholarship to the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins. And I went to Baltimore two days early and found a job singing in a nightclub. So my father wasn't very happy about that either. But he really couldn't do anything about it because he didn't have to pay any money for it. Anyway, when Lewis um, came to Baltimore that winter, he took me out to dinner, and I was, again, discouraged because there were wonderful writers in the writing seminars, and I didn't think I was one of them. And um, he told me he was proud of me, and that's all it took for me to continue on. Um, I eventually got one or two books published. Um, when he started Algonquin Books, I guess it was in 83, um, he asked me if I would write about those train wreck songs that I used to sing a couple of times with the hand bones. And I thought that was the silliest thing in the world. And I told him, only you and I are interested in those train wrecks. And he said, no, I think people would like it if you wrote a book about them. So I did. And then the next year, he published another one of my books. He has been pushing me behind me every, every step of the way ever since. He's been a wonderful mentor, a wonderful friend. And we have remained friends all these years. Um, I saw him a couple of weeks before he died. And we are, I, I still will miss him every day of my life. And the reason I'm ad-libbing this is that I forgot and left my speech at home. So <laughs> I apologize. But thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I, my life has been enriched by my associations with Lewis Rubin. Thanks. The thing is that the invitation to share in this celebration specified a focus on one thing Lewis did for me, 
or one indelible moment. And one is a hard number to work with when it comes to LDR Jr. Kind of like trying to write a haiku that encompasses the universe. How to choose what to select from so many memorable experiences. He was funny, he was wise, he was mischievous, he was smart, he was perceptive, he recognized the potential inherent in people and in places, and he cared about individuals and institutions becoming their best. So, after much remembering and sifting and reflecting, I salute my friend and mentor, Louis D. Rubin, Jr., who nurtured the seed of the university that struggled to sprout here in the late 1950s through his unwavering commitment to the intellectual development of his students and by abetting our efforts to fight that good fight with him, even when it got us in trouble. And so it was that we, like Hollins, began to grow into our true selves. When I attended the first session of Louis Rubin's modern novel class as a graduate student at Hollins in fall 1996, I was expecting to hear the kind of tidy lecture I had become accustomed to hearing in literature classes at my undergraduate alma mater. Instead, starting on the first page of Proust's Swan's Way, Mr. Rubin began modeling for us the process of close reading sharing his evolving understanding of the text over the course of many rereadings. <coughs> I was as startled as if expecting to be seated at the dinner table as a guest. I found myself being ushered into the kitchen to observe the meal preparation process. Only later that semester did I begin to appreciate the magnanimous gift Mr. Rubin had given us. Whereas, as an undergraduate, I had written papers that were virtually scrapbooks of literary critics' views. I now had interpretations of my own to share, drawn from my own close reading of texts. I learned much about the novels of Proust, Conrad, Faulkner, and Welty that semester. But what I most gratefully remember is the way Mr. Rubin modeled for us the process of literary analysis. And as a teacher of literature, I have tried to go and do likewise. One genre that was not mentioned is poetry. I turned out to be a poet. So not a journalist, not an editor, not a novelist, or any such thing is that Lewis has regretted that his whole life until his recent death. And um, he last told me recently to go write a short story. <laughs> he really did. Here's what I said about it, uh, being asked to write with the one thing, Lewis, it, not a one thing, it was the idea was to, uh, of their people thinking about this was to keep it short. So the one thing Lewis Rubin did for me took him 55 years to do. He taught me creative writing and became my advisor when I was 19. <clears throat> Last spring, when I was 74, he advised me to write more short fiction. He advised me on every step of my writing life. I was my mentor, my supporter, and my dear, one of my dearest friends. And that's the one big thing. I got a phone call this morning from Ann Warner. She had come back from Singapore yesterday and was planning to fly up here this morning. She got as far as Charlotte and US, not US Air, but the, the feds canceled the rest of her flight. So she turned around and went back. There was no way she could get here in time for this event. 
So, but I've got her, her one event here that I'll read to you. It's not double space, so I'll put on some space. The open hospitality of the Rubin household, the tasteless but legal 3.2 beer, and a set of peers and faculty in lively debate about each other's writing altered my understanding of what a liberal arts education might be, a time of humor and heart. The Rubin years at Hollins with talented new people coming in and an emphasis on identifying and developing talent in students were full of writings, readings, singing, disruption, and hilarity. Lewis graduated with our class, class of 67. It was years before Lewis and I crossed paths again, teaching at Spelman College in Atlanta with many family demands and a degree not from Chapel Hill, I thought I had left Hollins behind. But Lewis was still the irrepressible influence. He was a presence in African American literary studies, prominent and ahead of his time. I was surprised to learn how many interests and colleagues we had in common. But most of all, he was still the teacher. On several occasions, he took time to talk about projects and discuss students and give a kind of validation for the path I had chosen. I had yearned for that kind of experience and mentorship. Lewis was a part of many worlds, painting, publishing, printing, newspapers, music, literature, and in each world he was always an adventurer and a teacher. That's it. to each of you who has shared your own story and recollection of the impact in your own lives that Lewis Rubin had. As we heard these stories collectively, you have told a remarkable story of a man who has had tremendous impact on each of our lives and on our lives together, so thank you. And special thanks to Brooke Dixon, to Laura Anderson, to Gabe Sim Simpkins, to Anna Cobblestone for your support and help with our service today. And now, inspired by the promise Lewis Rubin saw in each of you and in the lives of our community together, enriched by the impact this man has had in each of our lives alone and in our community together, I encourage you to remember Lewis's words shared by Cindy today, be good. <laughs> Please join us now in the green drawing room as we continue to celebrate this great man who has meant so much to all of us.